we move into chapter three of uh, Second Corinthians is drawing a distinction in this epistle between himself and those teachers that were causing division. And remember we said that one of the items as we finished chapter two, uh, they were not only causing division there, but, but some of them, these false teachers were literally peddling the word of God, peddling the gospel of Jesus Christ for their own personal profit. And he questions here whether it's necessary to commend himself or to defend himself and produce letters of recommendation as the custom was. We talked a little bit about that uh, earlier in the book, that the, the custom was to, to get a letter from the church that you were with and uh, as you traveled around. In fact, the custom at the time of the Apostle Paul was such that if an itinerant preacher who went around to different churches, if he didn't have a letter with him, he wasn't even allowed to get up and to speak to the people. But Paul was well known to all of these churches. And so he he says, "Do, do I need a letter? Do I need some recommendation to commend myself, to defend my apostleship uh, uh, as the normal custom was. His conclusion was that their conversion was recommendation enough. That these Christians, their discipleship, their their walk with the Lord, their testimony as a church was recommendation to his ministry in the gospel. And so he argues that they are being mailed out as a letter to the world to send a message to the world of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today, I want us, as we look at these verses, to understand that God is also mailing each one of us out. He's mailing me out. He's mailing you out. We are being delivered from this place today into the world around us, into the community around us to deliver the message of Jesus Christ. The first thing I want you to see in verse two is that we need to understand that that we are letters that commend our teachers. Uh, In verse two, he says, you are our epistle written in our hearts and read by all men. And so uh, these these Christians, these Corinthians, were the, were the Apostle Paul's letters. He didn't need any other letters because they themselves represented Paul and his ministry. And in the same way that Paul saw these Corinthian believers as letters recommending his ministry, we today need to understand that our lives become letters that speak loudly about the ministry that we represent. How many of you here are members here at Monco Bible Fellowship? Let me see your hands. You're members here at Monco Bible Fellowship. Well, how many of you know that you, as you travel throughout the week, you represent Monco Bible Fellowship? I can, uh, I can remember as um, growing up when we would leave for school in the morning, my dad used to tell us as kids that, that we represent the Hart family. That as we're moving around in the community and walking to school and back and forth, that we represent the name of our family. And in a very real way, as children, we represented our parents. And and I guess Paul is saying here that that they are his epistle and they represent his ministry. This church represented the ministry of Paul. And we need to remember that same dynamic happens in our lives. And so if you walk out of here and your language turns sour, amen, and your temper flares up and you cheat and steal, and act, and act selfishly, it reflects back on all of us. It reflects back on the ministry that you represent. And I feel badly sometimes when we see in the newspaper or, or hear on the news about some Christians, sometimes even the leaders of a church, and they're outside the church knuckling it out. You know, yeah, I'm sure you've run across that in the news. It happens. Christians acting badly, and it reflects back on the ministry that uh, they represent. Uh, 
But most importantly, it reflects badly on the one you claim is your Lord and Savior. And if you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord, if you say and you say that you are a Christian, then when you go out and act like the devil, it reflects badly on your Lord. Amen. And so those of us that claim to be Christians, we bring disgrace to the gospel when our lives don't reflect what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. It's better that you take that Jesus bumper sticker off your car. Amen. Then to have all, you know, that Christian stuff, you got fish and everything else plastered all over your car and you're cutting people off and throwing bad signs out the window. Yeah, it's better to take that stuff off and not even claim the name of Jesus. Your life is a letter to the world. And it reflects back on the ministry that you represent and reflects on the Savior that you claim that you love. Amen. And so that's an awesome responsibility that all of us have to conduct ourselves as becomes the gospel of Jesus Christ. But also in verse 2, I, I want you to understand that you are a letter known and read by all men. Uh, he says to them that not only are you our epistle and that there's this connection between you and me, but also that you are being read by everybody, by all men. Paul noted that their lives were going to be known and read by everybody, not just the church. And so sometimes we feel as though we live in two separate worlds. And we come to church and we put on all our church stuff and pick up our go to church Bible and put on our church language and put on that church smile. And, and we come to church as though it's a whole different connection than when we're out in the world. But what, what Jesus wants us to understand is that, is that not only should you behave yourself in the church, but you are a letter that's being delivered to the world and that everybody's reading your life. As a matter of fact, people see what you do and it speaks so loudly they can't hear what you're saying. And some of us have all the doctrine down and we know the four A's and we can explain, the, you know, how to come to Christ. We got the language down. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We can say it all, but our lives speak so loudly. The people that did just tune all that verbal witness out. Your life is being read by all men. What's interesting here as you look at verse 2 is that there's a little bit of a literacy skill that's going on here, which you really can't see in English. But in Greek, uh, this is a play on two words that have the same root and sound. Uh, and so when he says that, that you are being uh, known and read, those two words um, uh, have the same kind of sound in Greek and they play on each other. It would be sort of like if I said to you that some of you are dozing and dazing. You know, a little, just a little bit of, a, of a literary, alliteration and, and the same kind of sound that goes on uh, that, that he's using that kind of skill. And so Paul is a poet and didn't know it. But uh, he's, he, he's, he sees some literary skill here as he's being creative in getting this message across. But he wants that message to be understood and to stand out so that people would understand that their lives are being known and read. They're being known and read. He wants those two words to jump out off the page to people. And I want it to jump out at you today. I can't, you know, put it in any alliteration or anything like that. I have no literary skill to be able to, to make it jump out other than just simply emphasizing that your life is known by people in the community, people on the job, People in your circle of influence, people that you come across, your letter, the letter of your life is being read by those people, and it is a powerful message that you're delivering. Yes. Much more powerful than what you say, 
Much more powerful than what you put on when you come to church. Much more powerful than how many verses you have underlined in your Bible. Much more powerful than many other things that we uh, accumulate in our Christian walk. Our lives are known and read by all men. You are a letter that's being delivered to the world. Are you with me? And so we have an awesome responsibility then to dispense the fragrance that we talked about last time, that fragrance of the knowledge of Christ, that fragrance of the love of God, sharing the love of God with the world around us. That should be the content of the letter that is in our lives. God is delivering you, and uh, you need to demonstrate the love of God. But also, look at verse 3. He says, clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Let me stop right there. You are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. I, I need you to understand here that you are a letter written by Christ, delivered to the world. Uh, and it, you are an epistle of Christ, although uh, Paul is saying that he has a hand in it, Paul understands that, that he has a, a, a ministry to accomplish, that he delivered some teaching to them. Paul had a hand in their growing up in the gospel, but that they are an epistle of Christ. You know that there is no such thing as, uh, as uh, you know, anybody doing anything for you or to you that can bring you to the place where you need to be in Christ. Uh, it is a God thing. And to whatever extent you represent Jesus in the world, you know, Monco Bible Fellowship might have had a hand in it, but God is the one who gets the credit. He's the one who does the work in our hearts. If there's any transformation that takes place, it's not because Pastor Tony had all of his points lined up in the sermon. It's not because there was any articulation of the word of God. The only thing that gets credit is that the spirit of God was at work in our hearts. Are you with me? And so we are an epistle written by God. He's the one at work. Galatians 5.22, where we read about the fruit of the spirit. It tells us that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that they are the fruit or the products of the Holy Spirit at work in us. And you can fake a few of them all the time, and each of them some of the time, but only God can change you so that your life reflects all the fruit all the time. That's a God thing. And so that's where we need to allow God to write on our hearts, to be at work in our lives. The message of our lives will become clearer and clearer to the world when God is more and more sitting on the throne of our hearts and of our lives. He's the one that needs to be in charge. That's only possible when the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, writing that letter on your heart. That's only possible when he is the king of your life. It's only possible when, when, when Jesus is in charge of you. And I think that for a lot of us as Christians, that's exactly where the line gets drawn. And I believe there are probably some of us sitting in here today, well, and, and you would put it this way, I don't mind coming to church I don't mind, you know, sitting with the saints. I don't mind, you know, reading my Bible every now and again. But to allow God to be, to start telling me what to do, that's where I draw the line. Because I'll take the input from the Bible. I'll allow God to share his thoughts with me. But I'm the one that's going to make the final call about what I do and where I go, and who I go with. Amen. I want to challenge you today that if you want to be a letter written by God and experience the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you've got to get over that self, get over that hump 
of being the final call and allow Jesus to be the ruler, director, and king of your life. Now, you don't have to say amen, but it's true. And, uh, and I think that that's exactly where many of us fall short. And, and, and if truth be known, you know, as far as we're comfortable, we'll go. But as soon as we're outside of our comfort zone, that's where we stop. And it becomes no more evident than, you know, I talk to a lot of Christians about missions, and I've shared that with you too. How, how many Christians have you talked to that, that said things like, well, I would never go there. What are they saying? I'm the final call. God can have his input, but I'm the one that's going to make the final call. And as long as you are the final call, as long as you are the king of your life, it, then you're, you're going to have, your letter is going to be scrambled. And the world's not going to get a clear message. Amen. I hope that sits, lets it, just let it germinate in your mind and in your heart. All right. We spend so much every day. Time, money, we use up, we waste so much. We spend time and money every day until it's all gone. Precious resources, powerful resources. What if you, what if you reinvested your time into prayer, your resources into support to help us plant churches, prepare leaders, and proclaim the gospel? What if you became a prayer fellowship partner? GOGF has been planting churches, preparing leaders, and proclaiming the gospel throughout the world since 1961. 14 churches on the eastern seaboard, producing weekly radio broadcasts that reach around the globe. We have ministry training in India, Africa, and the Caribbean. Partner with us. Partner with God. Invest in expanding and supporting His kingdom worldwide. Become a prayer fellowship partner. You have the time and resources to make a difference. Look at verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Surveys have, uh, have well, um, yeah, Surveys have shown that one of the cravings of the human heart is to live a significant life. That uh, most of us, if you were to strip it all apart, all we really want is we want to live a significant life. And, and, and what Paul is trying to communicate to us here in verse 5 is that to be God's letter to the world, all you need is the Holy Spirit. To live a significant life, all you need is the Holy Spirit. There's nothing more significant than to be a means of communication of the gospel to a world that's messed up and needs Jesus. The invitation to a significant life is right here. It's right here in this verse. And all you need, you don't need to, to, uh, to do anything except invite God into your life and give him control. Uh, he, he says here that, that, that eagerly desiring with faith for the spirit to write on your heart and change you, that's the pathway to a significant life. More eagerly than your desire, God is eagerly waiting and desires to come into your life and to transform you. And so uh, we are letters delivered to the world to communicate the gospel and all we need is the Holy Spirit to be at work. Small groups are good. And we have small groups right here at Monco. Uh, discipleship strategies are helpful. And, and we have good or bad discipleship strategies that I trust all of you are taking advantage of. Bible school can benefit you. Christian fellowship is important. But the one essential element is God at work as the king of your life. And you can, go for, you can go to Bible school for the rest of your life and seminary, you know, till you're 99 years old. You can live in church from Sunday through Saturday night. 
You can go to service every day of the week. You can do all of that. But the one ingredient that's going to, is the pathway to a significant life is Jesus being the king of your life. It's the Holy Spirit being at work in your life. It's allowing him to be the author of that letter that's being delivered to the world. And so I'm challenging you today to be God's letter to the world by allowing him to write his message on your heart. Are you willing to do that? Or are you willing to, to, to put him on the throne of your heart and allow him to be in charge? Now, don't say yes too quickly, because when he's the king of your life, he's going to ask you to do some things that are a little out of your comfort zone. He's going to push you in areas that, that, are, that are not going to be the easiest for you. He's going to ask you to, 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 to step out of your normal desired route. And he's going to put you in a path that maybe you wouldn't choose yourself. But if you allow him to write that letter on your heart, you allow him to be the king of your life, I'm here to tell you it, he will lead you straight to a significant life. He'll lead you to a place where you are effectively communicating the message of the love of God to the world around. And so we need to be God's letter to the world by allowing him to write his message on our hearts. And then look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Wow. Now, you all have heard that. You probably should have that underlined in your Bible, that the, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. To be a letter to the world written by the Holy Spirit, and uh, it means that, that we are, we are allowing the Spirit of God to be the interpreter and the writer of this letter and not the law. Paul is concerned that these Corinthians are using the right ink. And some of us, we say that we are a letter to the world. We want our lives to be communicating the gospel, but we're using the wrong ink. Are you using the right ink? Well, you say, well, what's the right ink? Well, look at the text. Uh, he wants them to use the right ink. Before we're delivered as letters to our families and coworkers and friends, we also need to make sure that our hearts are written on with the right ink. If your letter looks like a list of do's and don'ts, then you have the wrong ink. It's like writing a letter in red ink. Imagine writing a letter in red ink. That sends a certain message to the reader of that letter. And so we need to make sure that the ink is appropriate to the message. And we need to make sure that we are using the right ink and allowing the Spirit of God to write on our hearts with the right ink. The letter of the new covenant that God writes with is a message of love. The ink can't be seen on paper or on a stone tablet. That's what the text says. The message has to be interpreted by the Spirit because it's a message of love written on our hearts. And Jesus said that all the law can be summarized in two commandments. Anybody tell me what the two commandments are? To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And those two commandments are combined into one that's called the great commandment. And, and so uh, what we need to be able to do is to, is to allow uh, this great commandment to rule and to regulate us. And when you are regulated by love for God and love for your neighbor before any other desire, uh, then, then putting the needs ahead of your own, uh, that's the message that jumps off the page to the world. Let me tell you something. The world does not understand and the world can't make any sense out of somebody who, first of all, puts God first and secondly, puts the needs of others ahead of themselves. They'll call you stupid, 
foolish, dumb, crazy, weird. They don't understand the priority of putting the needs of others ahead of themselves. Are you with me? But when your life demonstrates a love for God above everyone else and a love for others ahead of yourself, you are producing a message that's delivered to the world that is so powerful it blows them away. And while they're calling you dumb and crazy and foolish, they're like in absolute amazement that you would love somebody that way. And it won't be long before they're going to, something's going to happen in their life and they're going to come to you and say, well, how in the world do you do that? And what's more than that, it's not only does, does God write this letter on your heart and deliver that message to the world, but, but while you're being delivered to the world, he's preparing their hearts as well to receive it. And you're going to see effective ministry take place in your life. And so we need to be regulated by love. On Wednesday night, we were going, going through Galatians, and we touched on this. And I told them, I said, now, I don't want to, like, step on my message for Sunday. But, uh, but, but this whole idea of our lives need to be regulated by love. When you have a question, and all of us end up with questions in our lives about whether I should do this or do that, whether I should go this way or, do, or go that way, whether I should make this decision or that decision, we're, we're all filled with those kinds of questions in our lives. And, and, and when love is the regulator, you can always ask the question, what would love do? And it might not always be in your best interest, but you ask the question, what would love do? Because what love would do, that's what Jesus would do. And it's more than just a bracelet on your, on your wrist, what would Jesus do? Because Jesus never acted in his own self-interest. He always allowed the love for God and the love for others to regulate his life and the decisions that he made. Now, I know I just lost half of you. But I'm just here to preach the word. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for you. It's a challenge for all of us. And all of us fall short. There's no question about it that we all fall short. But that we can't lower the standard. We've got to uphold the standard and strive to get better and better and closer and closer to what God is calling us to. He's delivering us, mailing us as you were, Listen, if this is like the post office, we're being sent out of here today into our families, into our communities, into our workplaces to deliver that message of the love of God. And uh, Paul's saying, you're an epistle. You represent our ministry. You represent your savior. You represent the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge you. That's where we need to go. Uh, the message of this kind of love, it just doesn't make sense to the world. We look out for numero uno, and uh, your, your rights come before others. That's the way the world looks at it. But God is sending out a different kind of letter with a different kind of message to a world that desperately needs the message of love. What a privilege to be the means of communicating the love of God to the world. Isn't that a privilege? Uh, are you happy about it? Yeah, you look real happy about it. <laughs> what a mission. Uh, are you ready for that kind of a mission? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. While you hesitate, just think about Jesus. Think about what a savior we have. Think about how he put our needs ahead of his own. Think about where we would be without his sacrifice. Don't you love him? Don't, isn't he worth it? Then let's dedicate our lives to being that kind of a letter that will deliver that same message to the world around us. Amen? I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I know it's, a, it's been a bit of a tough message today, but I want to challenge you 
wherever you are, whoever you are, to ask God to come into your life and to help you. You don't need, what you need is the spirit of God at work in your heart. If you would give him complete control, give him the throne of your life. Would you do that? Maybe I'm talking to somebody here and you're not sure that if you died today that you're on your way to heaven. You're not sure that your sins are forgiven. You're not sure that you're a child of God, that you're a part of the family of God. I want no one to leave here today without knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And all that takes is for you to confess your sin, to acknowledge that you need a Savior, that you've fallen short and ask him to come into your life and be the Lord of your life, to be your king, to be your master. Would you do that? Then do it right now in the quietness of your own heart between you and God. Maybe you're a Christian, but, but you, you struggle with, uh, with allowing him to write clearly in your life the love of God, putting self aside. And you want God to help you. Whatever the need is in your life, whatever that spiritual need is, I just want to pray with you. And up, raise hand and say, Pastor Tony, just pray for me. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, amen. I see those hands. Yes, amen. Just put it up and put it back down. I'll include you in prayer. Amen. What a privilege to be delivered by God into our world and deliver clearly the message of the love of God. He wants to help you. Any others? Last call. Just slip a hand up. Amen. Yes. Then Marco, let's stand for that word of prayer. And I'm going to invite those of you to raise your hands. Let's just join me down front. We, we got a few minutes left. Just, let's just pray together. Come on down and let's pray together. Whatever the need is in your life. You can slide around, make a little room. You know, the Lord knows the need of each one of our hearts. And Monko, join me in prayer as we pray for these that have come. Lord, again, we thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you for your willingness to strive with us, to change us, to transform us. And Lord, we, we've, so many times we've been the stumbling block. We've been the hindrance. But Lord, we ask that today would be a turning point in our lives. We pray for anyone here that needs to know Jesus as Savior, Lord. We ask that you would just give them that peace and assurance that comes with the confession of our sin and, and acknowledging who you are and what you've done for us as you died on the cross. Help us to understand it more. Help us to appreciate it more. And then, Lord, help all of us to, to take that same self-sacrifice that Jesus was the example of and, and to, to allow that message of love to be seen by all those who come in contact with us. Help us not to be the stumbling block to anyone who wants to come to Jesus. Help us in our lives to radiate the love of God, to share his love with the world. So, Lord, we pray a special blessing on each one that raised their hands, each one of these that have come forward. You know exactly what that need is. Meet that need, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.